Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, hello everybody. It's my pleasure to join the review, this review course from the Egyptian Society of Cardiology. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Ayman Khairi. I'm an assistant professor of cardiovascular medicine at Asut University Hospital and I'm going to speak today about aortic regurgitation's basic knowledge. We're going to speak about etiology, pathophysiology, uh, clinical presentation, uh, how to diagnose and how to treat patient with aortic regurgitation. First of all, the aortic valve is composed of three cusps, right and left uh, coronary cusps and posterior non-coronary cusps, and its opening and closure is depending on the pressure gradient between the left ventricle and the aorta. Once there is aortic regurgitation, there is leakage of blood from the aorta into the left ventricle during diastole, due to ineffective closure or co-optation of the aortic cusps. Our two main pathological uh, causes of aortic regurgitation is in the valve, intrinsic valvular disease, or in the descending aorta, aortic cause. First, intrinsic valvular disease is caused mainly by congenital bicuspid aortic valve, where there is only two cusps instead of three cusps in the aortic valves. It's an autosomal dominant condition. It's the most common cause of aortic regurgitation in young patients. Second of all, in our locality in Egypt, rheumatic fever is, is common cause, where the cusp is becoming uh, fibrotic with calcification in the uh, uh, top of the valve or in the apex of the valve, not in the base. Third cause of intrinsic valvular disease is infective endocarditis. Fourth is degenerative, senile age, more than 70 years old, mostly is combined, combined aortic age and aortic stenosis. And fourth, fifth is congenital vascular disease, collagen vascular disease. Chronic aortic root dilatation, where the pathology is not in the valve, in the cusp, it's the pathology in the aorta. There are four most common causes, is connective tissue disorders, is a Marfan syndrome, ehlers danlos syndrome, rheumatoid arthritis, or ankylosing spondylitis, or under the umbrella of connective tissue disorders, or syphilis. It's an infectious disease that was common in the early 90s, age more than 70, senile degenerative cause, or idiopathic with uh, cystic medial necrosis. All these causes result in chronic aortic regurgitation. What about acute aortic regurgitation? It can be caused from aortic aneurysm, aortic dissection, or infective endocarditis or trauma resulting in rupture of the cusp itself. Pathophysiology. For acute aortic regurgitation, there is sudden backflow of large amount of blood into the non-compliant left ventricle where there is no time for the left ventricle to dilate or uh, and compensatory myocardial hypertrophy to occur. So the left ventricle size is normal with large amount of blood into it, results in increase in left ventricular and diastolic pressure and increase in left atrial pressure reflected in pulmonary venous pressure will increase and result in sudden acute dyspnea, pulmonary edema is an emergency case. The murmur may be minimal. When you put your stethoscope, the murmur is minimal, and the peripheral manifestation on the of large volume pulse is not mostly absent in case of acute severe aortic regage. So the main idea of acute severe aortic regage, there is no time for compensatory mechanism. <coughs> so the left ventricle is small, ejection fraction is high, <coughs> but there is severe increase in pressure with pulmonary edema. In chronic severe aortic regurgitation, there is time. There is gradual backflow of blood from the left, uh, uh, from the aorta into the left ventricle, resulting in increased left ventricular endostolic volume and compensatory left ventricular dilatation and eccentric myocardial hypertrophy, which in initially maintains a stroke volume and the cardiac output. What's the clinical presentation in patient with aortic regurgitation? Three main complaints patients with aortic regurgitation can come with. 
first of all, palpitation, anginal pain, and dyspnea on exertion. Palpitation mainly results from forcible heartbeats associated with high pulse pressure and a proximity of the aortic apex, of the left ventricular apex to the chest wall due to left ventricular dilatation. Second is anginal pain, which can occur, can occur with normal coronary artery due to three main mechanisms. First of all, increase total myocardial oxygen consumption due to left ventricular dilatation, Compan uh, compressed intramyocardial uh, coronary arterioles, and most importantly, the coronary artery fell during diastole, and the aortic regage occurred during diastole, resulting in decrease the central aortic diastolic driving pressure from the aorta to the uh, coronary artery. These are main three mechanisms of anginal pain in patients with aortic, severe aortic regurgitation. <clears throat> then, destiny and exertion, which occur late. In chronic aortic regurgitation, patients often remain asymptomatic for decades, and exertion and destiny occur late. Why? Because of increased left ventricular size during compensatory phase, resulting in ventricular apex become close to the chest wall and patient, there is bounding sensation and patient has awareness of heartbeat, which is palpitation, especially when lying on the left lateral position, as you can appreciate in this picture. But in decompensatory phase, when <coughs> left ventricular stretching is excessive and it exhausts the frank stalling mechanism, <coughs> This result in decrease the forward blood flow, the stroke volume <coughs> decreased, and eventually the left ventricular endostolic pressure increase with a manifestation of heart failure and dyspnea occur late in patients with chronic aortic regurgitation. What about peripheral signs? <coughs> Corrigan sign, vigorous aortic pulsation. The carotid pulsation become vigorous and seen while standing the patient or sitting. Demuse sign, head nodding, synchronized with our arterial pulsation, Russell and Tatara. Molar sign with systolic pulsation of the uvula, open the, the uh, mouth, and you can see the uvula pulsating. Large volume pulse, decrease the systolic pressure, increase the systolic pressure that in large volume pulse. Collapsing in character, <coughs> we will uh, discuss this in more detail in the next slide. Quink is sign with pulsating nail bed. You do this compression, you see the red line pulsating up and down. Pistol shot or drop sign with audible systolic sound on the femoral artery. You put the stethoscope on the femoral artery and you, you hear a pistol shot sound. <laughs> With, due to sudden, sudden expansion of the collapsed vessel, blood pressure during the stool uh, decreased up to zero. So the vessel is collapsing during the stool and it suddenly uh, expand during the stool result in this uh, audible systolic sound. Pestle shot. Through this murmur where there is systolic and diastolic berwee over the femoral artery, you put the cystoscope and you do pressure above and below the uh, femoral artery where you, you hear a uh, systolic berwee or and diastolic berwee due to backflow of blood during in uh, diastole. Health signs. Normally, is the blood pressure in the popliteal artery in the lower limb is higher than the blood pressure in the brachial artery but not more than 20 millimeter mercury. If it's more than 20 millimeter mercury, it's indicate peripheral uh, hyperdynamic circulation. And if it's more than 60, it indicates severe aortic leakage. However, all these signs are historical actually, and it's not practical in the area of echo nowadays. A very characteristic symptom in, uh, a very char characteristic sign in patients with uh, significant aortic regurgitation is large volume pulse with collapsing character. First of all, we have to understand that the aorta act as a pump, not just a conduit of blood. In systole, it expands, and in diastole, it collapse, it contract to pump the blood forward and keep the diastolic pressure around 80 millimeter mercury. But in aortic regurgitation, 
there is leakage of blood during diastole, resulting in decrease in the aortic diastolic blood pressure. So instead of 80 blood pressure, the diastole result uh, decrease up to 40 or lower. And the large volume pulse in the left ventricle, large endodiastolic volume, result in increase in systolic blood pressure. So instead of 120, it becomes 200. So the patient has a large volume pulse due to decrease in the soul, increase in the soul, with a collapsing character. So a rapid upstroke and of a large volume pulse with rapid descent. You can say it collapsing pulse, bounding pulse, water hammer pulse all have the same meaning, rapid upstroke, rapid downs, rapid collapse, rapid descent, and have large volume pulse, with a large pulse pressure. Clinical tips. Why the diastolic blood pressure is low in patients with aortic regurgitation? Part due to backflow of blood from the aorta to the left ventricle in diastole, but mostly is due to a reflex decrease in the peripheral vascular resistance. Due to large stroke volume, it stimulates the carotid and aortic sinus by stretching, resulting in reflex vasodilatation and peripheral vascular resistance reduction. When aortic gauge is not associated with large volume pulse, a very important question. You can have a patient with severe aortic gauge without large volume pulse. Four cause, mild aortic gauge does not result in large volume pulse. Acute severe aortic regurgitation, no large volume pulse. Any cause that decreases systolic blood pressure, like left ventricular failure, myocarditis, or increase in diastolic blood pressure, like hypertension or resistance. During examination, the left ventricle is uh, dilated, so it's ill-sustained left ventricular apex, localized, shifted downward and outward. On the aortic area, you can hear the aortic murmur. Second aortic area, you can hear the aortic murmur. And you can see in this diagram, this is the normal, this is during systole between first and second heart sound, and diastole between second and first heart sound, you can hear the murmur of aortic gauge as lub dub lub dub As you can, you will hear now. It's a decrescendo early diastolic murmur. Start with second heart sound. Best heard for left sternal border between third and fourth intercostal space. A valve aortic gauge, but if it is due to dilated aortic root, it you can you will hear the murmur on the right uh, upper sternal border. Best heard in sitting position, leaning forward with expiration and with a diaphragm or cystoscope, and commonly severe aortic gauge associated with functional aortic stenosis over the ferrous aortic area, we will hear ejection systolic uh, murmur over the ferrous heart sound. Lub, dub, lub, dub, over the ferrous aortic sound, and lub, dub, lub, dub, over the left second intercostal, third or fourth intercostal space. On the mitral area, you will uh, appreciate an Austin Flint murmur, which is a functional mitral stenosis murmur due to severe aortic regurgitation, compressing, causing premature closure of the anterior mitral leaflet, resulting in functional mitral stenosis. So you will uh, hear during diastole over the mitral area at the apex of the heart, you will hear a rumbling murmur. So it's lub dub. Rub, lub, dub, rub. The difference between organic mitral stenosis and Austin Flint murmur is the first heart sound. The first heart sound is not accentuated, not accentuated in patient with Austin Flint murmur. Best heard in the left lateral position with a bell, not with the diaphragm, and it increases with isometric hand grip, as you can imagine this uh, uh, picture, the lower picture. Isometric hand grip maneuver results in increase in the afterload and it increases the aortic gauge and makes the Austin Flint minimum more uh, audible. What about the natural history of patients with chronic aortic gauge? First, 
Once the onset of severe aortic age started, the patient remained asymptomatic for decades because exercise resulted in shortening of the diastolic filling and decreased the amount of uh, regurgitant volume and patient not develop any symptom during exercise for decades. During these decades, the patient there is progressive left ventricular dilatation which maintain a normal left ventricular function, but left ventricular dysfunction occur before the onset of symptoms. This is the importance of uh, doing the operation even without symptoms in patients with severe aortic gauge. As you can see in this uh, green dotted line, if you start the operation at the point of left ventricular dysfunction, diagnosed by echo, the survival improved dramatically. But if you stay, wait until the onset of symptoms, the survival improved better than not doing surgery, but less than if you do it at the onset of left ventricular dysfunction. How to diagnose a patient with chronic aortic age? You do an ECG, chest X-ray, but the echo is the gold standard for diagnosis. You first, to play, uh, aortic gauge mean you have to examine the ascending aorta. Examine the aortic valve morphology and morbidity and uh, motility, mobility, left ventricular dimension, function, and Doppler assessment for the regurgitant severity. This is a, a, a classic picture of left ventricular uh, hypertrophy, the strain pattern in patients with significant aortic regurgitation with left atrial enlargement and left axis deviation. This is a classic also picture of a chest X-ray with cardiomegaly, left ventricular apex, and double contour of left atrial enlargement. And the echo. Echo in patients with significant aortic gauge should be done every three or six months. Once you have an ascending aorta dilated more than four, uh, four centimeter or 40 millimeter, it is recommended by recent European uh, guidelines to do a CT or CMR. As you can see in the uh, colored image, the three component of aortic gauge, this is the convergence of flow into the aorta, then the red or white line is the vena contracta between the uh, two cusps and the regurgitant jet area or jet lens. The width of the regurgitant jet area one centimeter below the cusps. And here is the uh, vena contracta, VC, vena contracta at the level of the cusp uh, with the regurgitant volume directed to the symptom. And here the regurgitant jet is directed to the anterior mitral valve leaflet. In assessment of regurgitant lesions, we uh, have three methods. Qualitative, semi-quantitative, and quantitative methods. The most important method is the semi-quantitative and quantitative methods. But the qualitative method it should be known. Valve morphology, color flow jet, width, continuous signal, continuous wave signal of the regurgitant jet, and the uh, reversal of flow in the, the descending aorta. Vena contracta and pressure half time, effective regurgitant orifice area, uh, regurgitant volume, and the enlargement of scardic chambers and vessels. Uh, this image classic, uh, show a classic six steps uh, technique to do an effective regurgitant orifice area and regurgitant jet, which should be done in all patients with uh, significant aortic regurgitation. First, in um, A, make a, a parasitic long axis view. You can see this aorta, left atrium, left ventricle. Then put a color. You will see the regurgitant jet going to the left atrium. And this line is uh, uh, a lysing velocity at 70. You make a zoom, C, in this uh, part of the picture, C, zoom. Then you change the Nicosit limit, make it decrease but, uh, from 70 to less than 50, up, uh, up till you can see clearly the convergence of flow with one uh, color. Then you measure the PISA radius, PISA radius from this point 
as the coaptation between the two cusps up to the end of the convergence of flow. And this is the piece the radius. Then you go to par uh, apical five chamber view and make a continuous flow uh, Doppler. Then do tracing of the reactant uh, jet by uh, TVI, time velocity integral, and then it's directly you will have the effective reactant orifice area is 41 and the reactant volume is uh, 78. What is mild aortic gauge and what is severe aortic gauge and in between is moderate aortic gauge. In qualitative measures, the aortic valve morphology normal in mild and abnormal flail large coaptation area in severe aortic gauge. The regulatory jet width is small, less than uh, fourth or 25% of the uh, left ventricular outflow tract area below the cusp or large, more than 50% of the outflow LVOT area in central jet. Uh, color width is faint. Yeah. Color, uh, uh, continuous flow signal is faint in mild aortic gauge and in dense in severe aortic gauge. The diastolic flow reversal in descending aorta is uh, uh, brief. Here it is hollow diastolic in severe aortic gauge. It is absent in the abdominal aorta and is present in the abdominal aorta in severe aortic gauge. The uh, vena contractor width is small and mild and more than six millimeter in severe aortic gauge. Pressure half time is uh, transverse or uh, mild in pressure half time and severe and become less than 200 in severe aortic gauge. The effective reactant area is less than 10 and the effective reactant orifice area more than 30 millimeter square and more than 60 reactant uh, volume a millimeter in patient with severe aortic regression. So we have to know this uh, three numbers, six for vena contractor, 30 for effective reactant orifice and 60 for reactant volume. And this image uh, show clearly that the vena contractor increase in mild uh, uh, from mild to severe aortic gauge and the pressure half time uh, decrease from mild to severe aortic gauge. So the steep is more steeper, the more steeper, more severe. Risk factors for poor outcome in severe aortic gauge increase in the solid dimension, increase in the solid dimension, decrease ejection fraction and presence of symptoms. How to treat this patient? First, prophylactic. Prophylaxis against rheumatic activity, prophylaxis against infective endocarditis, and the definite treatment is management of heart failure. ACE inhibitor and diuretics are mainly beta blocker according to the heart rate, but better ACE and beta and uh, diuretics. Treatment of AF and follow up echocardiography every three six months. Indication of surgery: one symptomatic severe aortic age is an indication of surgery, uh, aortic valve replacement. Asymptomatic severe aortic regage, if indication of surgery, if reduced ejection fraction less than 50%, less than or equal 50% ejection fraction, dilated left ventricle, left ventricle in systolic volume uh, dimension more than 50 millimeters. So it's a rule of 50. More than, less than 50% ejection fraction or more than 50 millimeter in diastolic uh, dimension or with other cardiac surgery or once there is uh, significant enlargement of the ascending aorta more than 50 also, so it's a rule of 50. It's an indication immediately for surgery in patient with severe aortic regression. Aortic valve repair, valve sparing aortic surgery, any state of aortic valve replacement should be considered in selected cases with inexperienced centers. This is in the last uh, European guidelines for valve replacement. This is my uh, key points at the end of the, my slides. The evaluation of aortic gauge require consideration of aortic valve morphology, mechanism of aortic gauge, and severity of aortic regurgitation, including careful assessment of the aortic route for dilatation. In patient asymptomatic patients with severe aortic gauge, careful follow-up of symptoms, status, and left ventricular size and function is mandatory. The strongest indication for valve surgery is the presence of symptoms, is a spontaneous or during exercise testing, 
and or documentation of left ventricular ejection fraction less than 50% and end and or in the systolic diameter more than 50 millimeters. In patient with dilated aorta, definition of aortic pathology, accurate measurement of aortic dimension by CT or CMR are crucial in guiding timing and type of surgery. And thank you very much for your listening.